This is the Monday, July 11th, 2016 episode of the History Author Show. Visit our iHeartRadio channel or subscribe on iTunes to enjoy a brand new interview every Monday morning, as well as Classical Wisdom Wednesdays and History in Five Fridays. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. How I miss those old pals of mine. The sawdust is gone from the floor Where we harmonize, sweet Adeline On the east side, west side Things ain't like before There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys Oh, New York ain't New York anymore May of 1945 saw the lights go on again. Once more, the nation's capital was blazing in all its glory. And in cities throughout the nation, the blackout was ended. Germany had surrendered. The war in Europe was over. There was still a war to be fought to a finish in the Pacific. But that couldn't dim the celebration that marked the fall of Hitler and the end of his dreams of world conquest. Three months later, crowds gather in front of the White House, awaiting the announcement of Japan's surrender from President Harry S. Truman. It took two atomic bombs to bring Japan to her knees. But now Pearl Harbor was avenged, and the news triggered the greatest celebration the nation has ever known. Hello and welcome. I'm your host, Dean Carianis, and this is the History Author Show on iHeartRadio. Today, we're traveling back in time, not only to witness humanity's greatest conflict, but to explore the aftermath and its effects on the men who fought it. After what the soldiers in the battlefield and the civilians saw during the fighting, after Hitler and Tojo's defeat and Mussolini met his end with his mistress, the guns fell silent. But that didn't mean that the conflict was over for the men who fought it. Our guest is Roger Boas, and his book is Battle Rattle, a last memoir of World War II. Mr. Boas was born in San Francisco in 1921 so he's just five years from celebrating his centennial. That long life, denied so many of that generation, has given him time to reflect on the meaning of his four years in uniform, including 11 months fighting in Europe as a field artillery forward observer with General George S. Patton's 4th Armored Division. Patton's 3rd Army formed the tip of the spear as the Allies thrust into France, Belgium, Luxembourg, Germany itself, and Czechoslovakia. For his service, the man who was then Lieutenant Boas earned both a Silver Star and a Bronze Star. He was raised a Christian scientist, but of Jewish ancestry, and that made it particularly troublesome when he was among the first American soldiers to find and enter a Nazi concentration camp. Experiencing, witnessing so much suffering and brutality left scars on the young Roger Boas, only in his early 20s at the time. The result is what we today call post-traumatic stress disorder. But in the Second World War, they called it Battle Rattle. For more of Roger Boas discussing his experiences, visit BattleRattleMemoir.com, where you'll find a very well-produced video about the book. You can also follow him at BattleRattleMem on Twitter and like Facebook.com slash BattleRattleMemoir. Okay, now that we've reached the shores of Fortress Europe, not heading into the fighting, But on our way home, let's meet Lieutenant Roger Boas and delve into the scars left by World War II on the inside. I'm joined on the line by Roger Boas, author of Battle Rattle, a last memoir of World War II. Sir, thank you for your service and for making the time to talk with the History Author Show today. It's a pleasure. It occurred to me when I was writing the script that a simple thank you for your service is kind of what you were given by the Army after VE Day and VJ Day. Those of you who served were kind of just sent on your way almost without any advice or any processing. And this is one of the things you describe in Battle Rattle. You write, quote, the Army trained me for a year and a half to prepare for combat. But what about teaching me to re-enter into civilian life, unquote? So what was the Army's procedure for that transition back home? They basically had no procedure. I got sent to an Army base uh, close to where the city where I live in San Francisco, 
and uh, signed some papers and was discharged, honorable discharge, after almost four years of service. The fact that emotionally, et cetera, I had been in combat for a long time, I was not taken into consideration. And they didn't tell me anything about my emotional state. They simply said, thank you and goodbye, and, and that was it. And there was no real follow-up for you either when you come home. And I think we today experience a lot of that through films and reading books like Battle Rattle. But I found that as I was reading your book, we sort of have pushed these things farther and farther down the road and in trying to understand it. We quickly look away, we move on to the next thing. And that was not your experience at all. You come home, but you're left to wrestle with this on your own. And that's one reason finally now at the age of 94, you wrote a book about it. This has been kind of cathartic for you. Yes. Coming home for me was pretty dreadful. I couldn't wait to get home. And when I got home and my parents were very nice to me and my grandmother, I was in terrible shape. There's nothing like war to scar one. And I know today uh, that I bore a lot of scars, and and I'm still scarred. You can't get rid of them. But that wasn't recognized in my time when I came home in 1945. What were your duties when you were attached to Third Army? I had taken ROTC in college and uh, graduated as a second lieutenant in the field artillery. And I became a forward observer. And many of the artillerymen are behind the lines working the guns. And the forward observers go out, find targets, and send the targets back to their guns. And my job was that of a forward observer. And uh, I was almost 11 months in combat, 24-7, and always as a forward observer, always out in front, always looking for the enemy and hoping I could find the enemy and shoot at him before he found me. I think when you read the word observer, you think you're just somebody there watching it, but this is certainly not the case for you being an artillery observer. You're in the thick of it. That is a stressful job all by itself. It's really something where any minute could be your last, and this is 11 months of this for you. Yes, there was some respite. Interestingly enough, when I actually found a target and went to work on it, I started to relax. I felt less fearful. The rest of the time, I was afraid. But at night, when we were free of enemy attack, we'd play poker together and and gather, and me and my officer colleagues, and uh, it was good fun. There are some moments you describe so vividly. I mentioned that when you first answered the phone. I said, incredible, considering it's 70 years ago. And you managed to recall so many details when writing this memoir. How did you? How did you dig all of this up again and face it? I started writing letters home almost from the time I went in the Army. I was sent to the artillery school at Fort Sill. I wrote from there. Then I went to the Mojave Desert to the Armored Training Center, and I wrote from there. And it continued. I wrote from England. And my letters home then were pretty cheerful. They changed as soon as we crossed the channel and got into Europe and the actual combat began. But for the most part, I wrote these letters to my mother and my dad and my grandmother, and they kept all of them. And so many, many years after the war, I started rereading them, and they were basically on what I based my book. I mentioned before that this term battle rattle in your war, after the Civil War, it was called Soldier's Heart. It was called Shell Shock in the Great War. Today, we cover it behind an acronym, PTSD. Describe for our listeners, and I'm sure that this is a question you were asked a million times, and maybe a lot of people don't really want the answer, but how do you try to explain when you come back to civilians what you're experiencing inside? Explaining to civilians, especially American civilians, I found extremely difficult. I came home, I'd been in combat for 11 months, and in the Army for four years, and my parents never wanted to talk about it, never mentioned it. It was as if I hadn't been away. And that was true of most of the people I ran into as I got back home. I went into the car business with my dad. The war was never mentioned by anybody. I did, of course, come across people who also had been in the service, and they found pretty much the same experience, I'm sure. In those days, if you had gone to war 
it was as if you had left your citizenship, were doing something else, and when you came home, okay, you're back. And it didn't even count or think about uh, what one had gone through. It was an eerie experience. And I ran into a very nice guy from who had fought in Vietnam, and he had the same uh, reaction. He came home and no one wanted to talk about it. He'd been through a dreadful war, as had I. And it was as if, uh, uh, you know, we'd gone away somewhere on vacation and, okay, now you're back. This is an amazing thing to me because you pick up a book like Battle Rattle. Actually, I don't know that there's any book out there that's like Battle Rattle, at least from the perspective of the author and the length of time. But you pick it up and you think another World War II book. And you're so saturated with things like movies, this generation, that we romanticize World War II. And we have seen it in a million movies. You come home and it's the exact reverse of what you describe in Battle Rattle, where the people at home want to talk about it and the soldier returning doesn't. But the way that you write about it in the book and that you're describing it now, really they wanted you to just fit right back and be the same person that you had been when you shipped out, and that wasn't the case. And that makes me think of something I try hard to keep at the forefront of my mind, and that's how subsequent generations romanticize World War II. So I felt it was important to read Battle Rattle for that reason, but I wanted to give you an opportunity to tell me what people here in the 21st century get right about the way we look at the war and what we get wrong about the conflict. Well, war is pretty awful. There's nothing good to be said about it in any way, shape, or form. War is killing and death. I'm talking about war where you're in combat, not at some base in the United States, safe and sound. And uh, people don't seem to recognize that. We've had soldiers fighting in Afghanistan, and now many, uh, some are in uh, Iraq and close to Syria and in other places in the Middle East, and they're at high risk both physically and emotionally, and they'll be scarred. They can't avoid those scars, and they'll come home scarred. We need to be careful that we treat them properly, psychiatrically or whatever. The push in this country is, let's have a big armed force and shoot it out. There's very little about arbitration. And when those guys go in to shoot it out, their whole being is at risk, both physically and emotionally. And something that occurs to me as you're saying this, and Battle Rattle definitely is a book that makes a reader think, is unwillingness really or lack of skilled diplomats, and I'll put it on both sides of it here, is also a legacy of this war. Because when people want to talk and people want to try a treaty, now we've had treaties before and we have talked things out in the aftermath of war to prevent new ones. And before World War II was certainly the aftermath still of World War I. Uh, we didn't get a good treaty at Versailles. So what do you think today we can learn from that? Because every time people bring up Chamberlain and they bring back the failure at Munich. And so the immediate thing is everybody is suddenly Hitler and Tojo and expansionism. And so we have to resort to guns sooner rather than later. What do you think we should be learning from that experience today? Uh, the Chamberlain experience, he was a poor negotiator. And uh, he negotiated without any strength with Hitler and uh, ended up in England going to war with Germany. Uh, today, we have a huge departments in our government that can handle negotiations, starting with the Central Intelligence Agency and the Department of Defense and, of course, the United States Department of State. And, in fact, Secretary Kerry has been a good example of someone who can move around and try and negotiate. It's extremely easy to drop negotiation and start shooting. And that's been a policy of many Americans. Let's go in and shoot them. And it gets us nowhere, except lots of cost and huge casualties and very little results anywhere on the shooting. I must say it was important to stop Hitler and we did it by shooting, but I can't think of any war really since then that justified shooting over negotiation. Uh, but negotiation seems to be not on anyone's mind in the government. There are some few who favor negotiation. Negotiate with a guy, Putin and Russia. Negotiate with this one and that one. We're more inclined to shoot it out. Shooting out is a losing way. There's just no way to win. 
there is little to be said about the advantages that war can bring. I want to back up a little bit to before you departed so you can give people an idea of the America that you grew up in. In Battle Rattle, you talk about your parents in California before the war and your time touring Europe. Now, on that trip to Europe, you don't go to Germany. You go around Germany. So explain your background and why you had no part of going into Germany. Well, I was born and raised in San Francisco, an only child. My mother was a socialist and my dad was a Republican. <laughs> and my mother, very intellectual, had been in Germany as a kid with her father who had to go over there. And so she spoke perfect German and was very intellectually interested in what was going on in, in Europe, especially in, in Germany. And we went back together in 1935. But her concern about Hitler was so great. He'd come in office in 1932, and we were a Jewish family. And she recognized his violent anti-Semitism and what it was doing to the Jewish citizens of Germany. And so she decided she did not want to go to Germany. So we bypassed it and went through the Dolomite Mountains. We ended up in Vienna. We met a very nice couple. I think Mother had a letter to them who turned out to be Jewish, younger than us. They took us to a uh, lovely outdoor cafe in the evening where we had dinner. All of a sudden, uh, one of them said, we really don't know what our future is. Now, this country is becoming more and more aligned with Hitler, and we're Jews. And sure enough, Hitler and his forces moved into Vienna in uh, 1939, I believe it was, and they were never heard from again probably sent to a concentration camp and killed, but no record of them. They just disappeared. And that happened to an awful lot of Jewish citizens in Austria. And we picked that fear up, my mother and I, when we were in Europe, from them and from others. What are we going to do about this neighbor of ours, Adolf Hitler, was basically their thinking. The best thing they could have done was to have gotten the heck out of Austria and gone elsewhere, South America, the United States, or what have you. And some did, but those that didn't usually ended up in a camp, concentration camp, and many were executed. My guest is author Roger Bowis, author of Battle Rattle, a last memoir of World War II. You can follow him on Twitter at Battle Rattle Mem or like him at Facebook.com slash Battle Rattle Memoir. Francoise Skirman writes at Jewish Journal, quote, One would have thought that all direct testimonies of World War II had already been recorded. Well, not so. Roger Boas, one of the first American soldiers to enter a German concentration camp, Odruf, remained silent for 70 years before recently publishing his memoir at the age 94, unquote. 94. Sir, most people aren't writing their first book at your age, needless to say. After the war, you ran your father's Pontiac dealership. You worked for 20 years for PBS TV. You had stints in politics and government, including serving as chair of the California Democratic Party. So why write Battle Rattle in 2016 rather than 1946 or, say, the 50th commemorations in 1995? Did you always want to write these down or did it just come to you late? I sort of put it out of my mind, so you might say it came late. But I had written all these letters home, and I finally, a year or so, a couple of years ago, decided I'd take a good look at them. I'd forgotten a lot of it. Once I started reading these letters, with my folks had kept every single thing I wrote, the story of what I'd gone through came back to me. And as questions arose, I began to call those colleagues of mine that were still alive to check their experiences and so forth. Some of them had never talked about the war since then. Others refused to talk about it. But I did pick up information that reminded me. And then I read carefully all these letters that I had written. And then I thought, I better go back and take a look. So I went back to Europe from San Francisco and went to positions we would had in France and uh, in Belgium, Bastogne, and into Luxembourg, where I was hospitalized during the war, and on into Germany. They were kind of like field trips for me, and it brought back an awful lot. And then I decided that the war was so awful, I ought to at least unromanticize it for my grandkids and for other grandkids elsewhere. 
And that's when I started digging in, reading those old letters, and writing the book. I wondered, as I read your letters in the book, what you want to say to that younger version of yourself, that young lieutenant, only his early 20s. You've lived so much of your life since then. What would you say to him today, if you could? I would say to him, don't fool yourself. Don't romanticize something that's not romantic at all. Keep always in mind that if you go into combat, you're going to be scarred and scarred for life. And that the best thing that you can do to protect yourself from having those scars overwhelm you is to seek good advice, especially psychiatric advice, if you can find it at a medical center or a government center someplace. Learn how to work around these scars. Learn how to adjust to the dreams that you get. I'm 94, and I still dream about that bloody war. Can't be helped. They occur all the time. It was just too much. It's in your system. So you have to tell yourself, here's how I move forward with it. It's a therapy that can be very, very helpful. I might add, uh, I had thought that maybe if I, I made a mistake in coming home to San Francisco where my family is, and then I would have felt much more differently, say, if I had stayed in Europe, gone to a university in England, Oxford, or one of those places. But the psychologists I talked to told me it wouldn't have made any difference. The war and the scars were in my system, and they would remain there and cause the same reaction no matter where I was. I could have been in South Seas. Wouldn't have made any difference. So the whole goal, I'm thinking of those now serving in Iraq and so forth, is to get good government help if it's being provided these days and learn how to adjust emotionally. Do you think we're doing a better job today than we did back then as far as when the men come home? Or do you think we... Uh, I guess the word would be fool ourselves into thinking that we can solve any problem right now with science and with treatment and with therapy. For instance, the actor Ken Wall, who you may be familiar with, it would just happen to be his Twitter feed. He writes a lot about military suicides. And he said, quote, I could not believe it when I started doing the numbers on this, the sheer numbers. What the hell is going on, I believe, was his reaction to it. But you would think we would be better at this today. We've experienced, as you said, war enough times that we should be better about dealing with the scars. Or is it sort of like trying to talk somebody through an external scar? Do we not recognize that the internal wounds are just as much like losing a leg in the emotional impact that they have? What is our track record today, I guess I would ask you, compared to what you experienced? I expect that our track record now is better than it was, but it's still not very good. I don't think there's much really clear understanding of post-traumatic stress disorder and what it does to a person. And I think that many of those who are in the service or stay in the service because they're in a framework that makes them feel safer than leaving that framework and joining society again out of uniform. And I think the armed forces are having a difficult time handling those who are leaving the service after they fought in Afghanistan and Iraq and so forth. We have had thousands in Afghanistan and still have nine or 10, 12,000 there. Those folks are all at risk, emotionally I'm speaking. And I think the understanding of post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, is very, very small and not knowledgeable. And it needs to be understood. There's still the policy or habit in this country of the servicemen is back and okay, glad to see you, go to work, and that's it. There needs to be more than that. That service man or service woman, if he or she has been in combat, needs to have government assistance, not only financially, but definitely psychologically. I want people to know that your book has many slice of life moments and also some lighthearted things, even from the time you were serving in the horrible war. 
for instance, you have a lot of pictures and I was disappointed myself that you had so many great ones. And I got to kind of that last one you have with your girlfriend, I believe it is in England stationed there before D-Day. And you say in the caption that your camera got stolen. So that's it for your pictures. I was very disappointed by that. But you experience life as a soldier before you go off to war. So that's all in there. You get a feeling of what it was like to see your transition there's also a particular lighthearted moment during the war, during the invasion of Germany, and that's when you have a brush with Adolf Hitler's bed. So I wondered if you would tell that story, since it's a little, little lighter. Yes, it is a good deal lighter. The war for us ended in Czechoslovakia, us being my division, the 4th Armored Division. And I was in a field artillery battalion, motorized field artillery battalion in that division. But before we got to Czechoslovakia, the division stopped awaiting orders near the town of Bayreuth, Germany. And Bayreuth is where Wagner wrote his beautiful operas. And another officer and I, uh, Lieutenant Les Davis, he also a field artillery forward observer, thought we would drive around Bayreuth and see what we could see. And we came across the residence of Wagner which was pretty well banged up from shells. And it had an addition to it, which was much newer and had escaped the shell fire. So we thought we'd take a look. Here we were in Wagner's home. And we walked in and we came across three or four very, I would say, middle class or upper middle Polish slave girls, or at least Polish women who had been picked up by the Nazis and put to work. The ones that we met in the Wagner residence were very nice and very intelligent. And Les Davis played the piano quite beautifully. And they had a piano in the house. And he started playing the piano. And the girls all went for him and wouldn't look at me after that. And we went upstairs. And there was this very clean room with a nice bed. And they, the girls, explained that this was the room that Adolf Hitler slept in when he came to the Bayreuth Festival, the Wagner Festival, which he did from about 1932 or three when he took office until 1939 when Germany attacked Poland under his orders and went to war. And so for six or seven years, he'd been coming down there and Frau Wagner uh, liked him and put him up. And here was his bedroom and a great big nice bed, and Les Davis and I said, what the heck, let's sleep here tonight. <laughs> so we climbed in his bed and lay down in there, and all of a sudden, <laughs> there's a knock on the door, and in come two lieutenant colonels. We're both first lieutenants, so they're far our superiors, each one in charge of a neighboring artillery battalion. And they said, what the heck are you guys doing here? And we said, this is Hitler's bed. We thought we'd give it a try. And I said, okay, enjoy yourselves. So <laughs> that, that's how I happened to end up in Hitler's bed. How did it feel? Uh, my antipathy to Hitler was very, very great, was and still is. And I was uncomfortable. He committed suicide a week later. But for me, he was just one of the most terrible people that ever lived. I'm Jewish. So I knew if he could get his hands on me, or if he could get his hands on all my Jewish friends in England, or if he could get his hands on the Jews in the United States, what would happen to them? The same thing that happened to the Jews in Poland, six million of them, and in his own country, Germany, executed, horribly treated and executed. So being in his bed didn't charm me particularly, but I knew it was an experience, and it was all happening so fast it was hard to believe. For one thing, we'd been in combat for 11 straight months, and all of a sudden, the shooting for the moment had stopped, and it was peaceful. And for a uh, combat veteran to adjust to peace is a very uneasy, difficult task, as I found when I came home. I would have imagined that. I would imagine sleeping in combat and grabbing it when you can. You'd be repelled if it was a comfortable bed because you wouldn't want to enjoy it. That would have been an odd thing. But as you said, you, you have to do it, I guess, if you have a chance. This is something I wanted to point out to people, too, that you talk about in Battle Rattle. Your hatred for Hitler and your anger and your willingness to stop him predates the war. This is not something that after Germany declares war on the United States, you go after him. Your 
a backer of FDR at the time and you want us to get into the European fight, Hitler prevents FDR from having to make that choice and just focus on Japan by declaring war on us. But you are ardent about supporting the war effort and stopping Hitler. And you have a moment where you have a debate in school and you have to take the opposite side. So tell the listeners how you feel afterwards when you're arguing against entering the war. I think I'd put it this way, Dean. Before I went into combat, I romanticized war. I had this huge anger for Hitler generated by my mother initially when I was much younger who had gone back many times to Germany with her father and who understood politics and knew how bad he was. So I was anti-Hitler for a long time. But my feeling was, let's go get the guy. But once I crossed the channel from England, where I was full of let's go get him, and actually got on the soil of France and was surrounded by men, Americans on stretchers, waiting to go home, waiting to go to London and uh, England and hospitals, a fear hit me, a fear that never left me. The romanticism stopped. And that fear it was an enveloping environment that you really couldn't shake. And for me, the way to shake it was to start killing, be a killer. And that was the way most of us shook it. We were being shot at, let's shoot back. Once you get that fear, it's very, very hard to shake it. I could shake it on occasion, but it stayed all the time. It therefore turned me from a reasonably decent chap, I described myself, to a killer. General George S. Patton, I'm sure you've told the stories of serving under him many, many times in the 70 years since the war ended. So I wanted to ask the question in a slightly different way, and that is, in your long perspective, how have you found questions about the general changed over time, and have your feelings shifted on him as well? He became my idol. I first came across him, if you can describe it that way, uh, when he uh, was appointed commander of the 3rd Army, and my division, the 4th Armored, uh, was under it. And all of its officers, I was a first lieutenant, were ordered to put on their best uh, uniforms and go to the theater that we had in our barracks in England, uh, where he was introduced to us. And uh, he looked perfectly splendid. But what came out of his mouth was disturbing. Uh, he said that he knew a uh, major who had been shot 56 times, and as he put it, the son of a bitch is still alive. And lots of profanity. And all the officers thought, who the heck is this guy? And he had been known for slapping a soldier in the Sicily. But then as we broke out of Normandy and went through the town or city of Avranche, France, which had been heavily, heavily bombed by the enemy just that day. And as we turned the corner in our armored division procession, there standing on a command car looking like just wonderful, shiny boots and helmet and pistols on either side and saluting us, he even saluted me, was General George S. Patton. And we all came to revere Patton. Now, he, for us, was the best thing about the war that any of us came across. I ran into him several times, talked to him several times, once at very close range in a hospital, and my feelings about Patton were always very, very favorable. And to this day, I respect him greatly. But I understood that he had his shortcomings and was not the perfect guy. But he was the perfect leader for us in combat in World War II. In early May 2016, the Obama administration revealed the latest numbers. 265 active duty service members killed themselves in 2015. The USA Today headline was, U.S. military suicides remain high for the seventh year. What can we learn from your book to better reach these men, do you think? Well, two things. I think by telling them the truth, young people today who are thinking of joining up or have recently joined up, let them know what it's all about. Let them know that war is awful, that there is absolutely no advantage in a shooting war, and that you have to adjust to that, therefore, and be careful emotionally, and also to provide very, very good emotional or psychiatric services to those who return home rather than simply dismissing them at some military camp. I think it's easier said than done. 
My goal would be at all costs to avoid a future war if we couldn't negotiate our way out of it like we should. But negotiation seems to be a choice of few. Shooting it out seems to be the way everybody seems to think. What they don't think about is the results of shooting it out and what it does to their families who are involved. So it's a way of thinking and education, which I think the United States is not very far along with. Those who are talking about negotiation rather than shooting, and there are several very prominent members of government and so forth who talk that way, I kind of washed away. No one listens to them. Uh, they're in the Defense Department, too. So it's a way of thinking and a way of communicating. And it's an uneasy task today with the violence that's going on in the Middle East and the antipathy of some of those countries like Iran and Saudi Arabia and the rest to one another. And the exodus of people from Syria and the whole, the whole ball of wax is treacherous as all get out. And to deal with that, you really have to have a government policy that says, we want to avoid war. We want to do everything we can to properly negotiate a situation that both sides can eventually agree to. I appreciate so much your time today. I wanted to give you one last opportunity. You described a man you served with named Du Dent. And when you talked about visiting his gravestone, you said it looked neglected. You described it as sort of being washed away or rubbed away. Nobody had bothered to maintain it. So for all of us who care about history and the people that fought in World War II specifically, tell us a little bit about the kind of gentleman Du Dent was and what debt we owe him. Well, Du Dent, I failed in many ways during the war, and he was probably my most serious and greatest failure. He, like me, was a forward observer. He'd been a football star in North Carolina, I believe it was, at the University there. No, the University of Colorado. In fact, he's still written about, if you go to the local newspapers, as one of the great football players there of all time. And he was battling every day along with the rest of us. And we came to an area in north-central France. In front of us was the city of Troyes, T-R-O-Y-E-S. And we had to be able to conquer Troyes. The German forces were embedded there so that we could cross the Moselle River and keep going on toward Germany. I was sort of the senior forward observer, but I was also my battalion's adjutant which meant I was close to the commanding officer, our colonel. The evening before we attacked the city of Troyes, Dent sought me out and said, if you don't mind, there's something I need to talk to you about. I really didn't know him very well. Here was a great athlete, one of the great football stars of his day. Me, I, I could barely catch a football, much less throw one. And here he was seeking me out. We hadn't had much to say. And he said, I'm pretty sure that tomorrow I am going to die. And I kind of, you know, said, well, no, wait a minute, we all feel that way. And we could get hit right now by a shell and be dead in a minute. But your chances of dying are probably a smaller percentage than 50%. No, he said, if I go in that tomorrow, I'm going to die. And I'm wondering if there's some way I could avoid going in tomorrow. Going in meant being a forward observer, going in on the attack against the Germans in Troy. So I told him to go see my uh, bat our battalion operations officer, a very fine guy named Parker, Bob Parker. And so he did that. And I said, you tell Parker how you feel. Ask him for another assignment. And he went to see Parker and came back and said, no, Parker said, I appreciate what you're saying, and I'm sorry you feel that way, but I have no choice. I go on a rotational system, and your turn to go is now, and you have to go. I might add that Bob Parker, who became our battalion commander later and was a marvelous commander and became my lifelong friend, told me years and years after the war that his decision about doing that to do dead is one of those he regretted the most or the hardest. It was a hard decision. So I really wasn't thinking clearly enough for Dent. What I should have said to him is, okay, you're afraid of going across the plane and shooting it out with the Germans and Troy as a forward observer, and you're going in your Jeep. Get out of your Jeep. Go in your light tank. Close the turret. You can see and shoot and radio commands. Don't go in your Jeep. But I didn't have enough good sense to think of that. I was not entrepreneurial. 
I simply said, keep going, and that's what he did. And he got halfway across Troy, and he and his driver were machine gunned to death. And I always felt after that. When I went, I went to his, I didn't know where he was buried. I tried to find him in Europe when I was over there later, and they had no record of him. And then one day in San Francisco, I get a letter from someone in the War Department in Washington that he's buried not far from where I live, in the Golden Gate National Cemetery. And so I went out that day to visit his grave. Dent had been married and had two kids. And from what I read, his wife, who was his college beauty, immediately married another guy. And there his grave was. You could hardly see it. I mean, no one had been there. The area around it was kept clean by the cemetery, but the gravestone, I had to get a wet rag and polish it down, clean it down so that I could actually read. There it was, Lieutenant Lewis R. Dent, to make sure I had the right grave. But he was gone and forgotten. And I was thinking to myself, here I am in my 70s, and here's Dent dead all these years. We were a year apart in age. And he died the day after my 23rd birthday, and gone forever. And I thought if I'd only said to him, don't go in your damn Jeep, go in your light tank, he might be alive today. And I've always, of course, deeply, deeply regretted my lack of good thinking in dealing with dude Dent. Well, Battle Rattle, you get to meet and remember a lot of these people. If I go to San Francisco, when I go there, I have some friends out there. I will seek out Dude Dent's grave in the years to come, decades to come, because we should remember all of these soldiers who died. So easy to say, hard to do, and hard to make the tough decisions about preventing war whenever we can. And if we are going to fight a war, we want to fight it in such a way that it doesn't drag on. It should be as brief as possible. I want to thank you for giving me so much to think about here in Battle Rattle. I'm sure other readers will feel the same way if they go pick it up. Again, the title, Battle Rattle, A Last Memoir of World War II. If you think you've read everything about the war, I guarantee you haven't read anything like this. And it was such an honor to meet you through the book and then even more so here to speak to you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join me today. Gene, I thank you very, very much for giving me this opportunity. I am grateful to you. Well, the honor was all mine. At least I could do. Thank you. Again, the book is Battle Rattle, a last memoir of World War II. As always, you can find the Amazon link to purchase your copy at historyauthor.com. And we hope you will click through there or even bookmark the URL off the banner ad on our homepage for all your online purchases through Amazon. Amazon Amazon.com gives us a small percentage of every purchase you make at no additional cost to you. Thank you to Roger Boas for joining me and for discussing the human toll of World War II, which we too often forget and are too often obscured behind Hollywood blockbusters and big band music. Please remember to follow Mr. Boas on Twitter at Battle Rattle Mem or like him at Facebook.com slash Battle Rattle Memoir. And let us know what you think of the book and the interview on Twitter at History Dean or Facebook.com slash History Author. That's it for this installment of the History Author Show. I hope you'll join us for Classical Wisdom Wednesday, History in Five Friday, and next Monday's all new interview. And remember, if you do subscribe to us on iTunes, thank you, and please take a minute to leave us a review. So, until our next trip into the past together, thank you so much for joining us, and happy reading. The greatest, the wildest celebration of them all was in New York's Times Square. Never before or since has there been a crowd like this on the Great White Way. Two million people screamed their relation at the end of the most devastating war in recorded history. For 24 hours, the celebration went on. And not for a minute did it lag. Victory had come. Old glory waved over a happy land. The boys won the war and came home from the fight. The last night on Broadway was almost his night. But ever since then, it's a different street. Gone are the places where the gang used to be. We still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. 
There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. 